thank you very much, John. First, I would like to extend my apologies to the audience, uh, the, the co-speakers, and, and John for leaving you uh, alone. Uh, I was late, and uh, of course, that was against my will. Please accept my apologies for that. So what, what I would like to speak with you today is the relevance of molecular markers in GIST in 2013. And that's a topic which has been evolving in the last 10 years quite significantly from these initial reports more than 10 years ago showing that actually molecular markers in GIST were more complex than we initially thought on the nature of the mutation. So we identified initially these mutation on KIT, which arise most often in the juxtamembrane region, exon 9, exon 11. And afterwards, we identified additional mutation on other receptors, such as PDGF receptor alpha. And now we start to understand that actually the landscape of GIST is becoming more and more complex. And we probably should not call GIST a single disease, but mo most likely multiple disease with different outcome. And this is striking to note that actually we started with this uh, uh, with these trials, which compared uh, imatinib two doses, and we had to compare these trials with historical control to demonstrate the activity of imatinib. When we did this trial, we, put, we pulled together all the different subsets of GIST, and this probably led to uh, some very important observations, but right now we have to move forward. GIST are at least 10 different diseases, and these different diseases should be treated differently both in the adjuvant setting and in the metastatic setting. Probably the best example is what is happening around PDGF receptor alpha mutation. We all know that PDGF receptor alpha mutation are occurring in about 10 to 15 percent of GIST. And there, are, there is a wide variety of different mutations, but the most frequent is occurring in exon 18 of uh, this receptor mutation of oncodon 842, converting D into a valine. And actually, this mutation encodes for a very resistant protein to imatinib. Imatinib and all tyrosine kinase inhibitors in general. And when we looked at this retrospective study which gathered patients from Australia to the US, Europe, and everywhere in the world, we could get only 50 patients, showing that actually patients with this mutation had a median progression-free survival of two months, median overall survival of 12 months in advance phase, exactly what we had before the, uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor era. While all the other tyrosine kinase mutations uh, occurring on PDGF receptor alpha are relatively sensitive to, uh, to, to imatinib. This means this has several consequences, and among the consequences that uh, we should probably consider this mutation as a separate entity and consider the treatment of this patient in a different way, both in the metastatic phase and in the advanced phase. And the landscape of GIS is actually changing. When we look at the initial historical series, we had a median overall survival which was in the range of uh, five years. Now the overall survival is probably improving very much. And you can see on this slide that progression-free survival has also improved significantly with the median progression-free survival in the current BFR14 update, BFR14 study gathering 400 patients, which is in a range of two and a half years, 30 months, probably even better actually for the subset of patients with exon 11 where you reach 40 months median progression-free survival while patients with exon 9 or other types of mutation are more in the range of 20 to 24 months median progression-free survival. So this is not the only prognostic factor for progression-free survival, but this is a major prognostic factor for uh, progression-free survival. And we have uh, this parameter, which is not only, only a, uh, a prognostic value, but also of predictive value. We now all agree to treat patients with exon 9 in advanced phase at a dose of 800 milligrams per day. Whether we should do that in the adjuvant setting remains an unsolved question. Hopefully, we'll have a worldwide try to try to address this uh, uh, this question. Different molecular subsets of GIST should be treated differently, both in adjuvant and in metastatic phase. In the adjuvant phase, probably this landscape is going to evolve very much. Our colleagues from the SSG and AIO demonstrated quite nicely the improvement in overall survival, which is observed with three years adjuvant treatment. And they also delineate quite a nice and uh, sophisticated prognostic index in, in order to try to achieve the best uh, identification that we can have for the treatment of this patient. Who are the patients who are going to relapse? Who are the patients who have a very small risk of relapse? This is now based, this shall, should now be based on five digits 
digit parameters, which are the size, mitotic count, the site of the primary tumor, the presence or absence of rupture, and importantly, the mutation. This is guiding the treatment. An important piece of information about adjuvant treatment, though, is whether we are pushing uh, adjuvant treatment in a sense that this is going to induce uh, resistance earlier than we expected, or whether we simply postpone the, uh, the relapse. And I think a very important point has been made this year by the report of the EORTC, uh, AGG, and as you can see, multi-group uh, randomized trial of the uh, uh, phase three trial comparing imatinib versus no treatment during two years. And actually, we observe very similar um, findings in terms of progression-free survival in high-risk patients. More importantly, in my opinion, is the right-hand panel. Because this slide shows you the imatinib failure-free survival, which means the time at which the patient is progressing while receiving imatinib, either in adjuvant phase or in metastatic phase. And what is shown on this slide is that we apparently have no difference. There is a slight advantage for the adjuvant treatment. So this, for me, is a major finding, strongly suggesting that we are not pushing resistance when we put pressure on the cells at a microscopic level, i.e. when there are not many cells in, in, in the body, adjuvant treatment is not apparently selecting for imatinib resistance, and I think this is a very important conceptual finding and probably one of the most interesting findings of this study because now three years adjuvant treatment is a standard and probably two years is not enough. This also points out to the very important concept that is still not explored and not solved, which is whether we should investigate further surgical removal of the lesion. In other words, is the probability of resistance, molecular resistance in GIST, a function of tumor cell mass, which is intuitively, intuitively something which is logical, but which is not yet proven. And this certainly calls for a, 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 a new attempt to do a randomized trial eva evaluating surgery to completely remove metastatic masses in, a, in, a, um, in an advanced phase. This is a major conceptual question which needs to be, to be answered. Molecular resistance in GIST is not only in first-line metastatic phase. Also in second line, we all know the results of sunitinib in terms of time to progression. We observed that the resistant mechanism which were in place for imatinib are also in place for sunitinib through the emergence of a multifocal, multi-clonal resistance emerging at progression. And not only primary mutation has an impact on the outcome of these patients in uh, second-line sunitinib, but also the secondary mutation which are arising most often on exon uh, 17 or 18 or exon 13 and 14, which are more sensitive to, imatinib, to sunitinib pressure as pronostic value in advanced phase. So that's a finding which is important. And what we start to see is that not only the problem is a selection of, uh, of clones, but also the heterogeneity of this clone which is, uh, which is arising. And this has been very nicely shown in a completely different model, re renal cell carcinoma, in a paper which is, well, was published a bit more than one year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing the multiclonal evolution of tumor cells as early as in the, uh, uh, in the localized setting, more evolving in the metastatic setting. Very important con conceptual design. Maybe some other drugs have a broader uh, uh, form of activity. Regorafenib was shown to have activity in GIST, failing imatinib and sunitinib. It has a slightly different kinase inhibitory profile. The GREED trial was reported a few months ago in the Lancet and showed quite nicely in a well-balanced population of patients in, with a good performance status and uh, extensive pretreatment in, in advanced phase that actually regorafenib was able to postpone progression in this group of patients with an improvement which was observed in all subset of patients and with an improvement which was not translated into an overall survival improvement because probably of the crossover. What is interesting in this observation, and this was reported by George Dimitri and collaborators recently, is that the benefits of regorafenib seems to be of similar magnitude in exon 11 and exon 9. The subgroup of patients with other mutation is too small to draw a definitive conclusion, but this is by itself a very interesting observation, slightly different from what we have with imatinib and, uh, uh, and sunitinib. And probably to address this question, in the immediate future, we will have technologies which enable to, us to, do, to look 
look at this question through liquid biopsies. Looking, and this was reported this year at ASCO by George Dimitri and collaborators again, showing that you could address the question of molecular heterogeneity through a simple blood sample in some of these patients. With this Beaming technology, what was very interesting is that you could confirm the nature of the mutation from the primary uh, tumor in the, uh, in the circulating DNA, but also that you could find additional mutations, secondary mutation, looking at this plasma circulating DNA. This is a major uh, significant, this is a, a result of major significance, and I think we will use more and more this technology in the future. Other agents are also of interest. So nilotinib failed to be superior to best supportive care plus other TKI in this randomized study. This year, we reported the re final results of the phase three trial of nilotinib versus imatinib in first-line treatment of GIST, and we observed actually in this face-to-face -face comparison, one-to-one -one randomized setting, that actually some molecular subgroup had a poor outcome. Exon 9 do badly with nilotinib, while exon 11 seem to do very similarly to, uh, to uh, imatinib in this, uh, in this study. Different molecular subset of GIST should be treated differently in metastatic phase and in the advanced phase. And this is probably true for all the a other agents which have been tested and uh, on which you can find the results summarized on this slide. So this really calls for, uh, st for studies which will now look prospectively at the, uh, what are the molecular subsets of disease sensitive to such, uh, to such agent. This approach, which was um, illustrated here with dazatinib, which failed to demonstrate its activity, was of interest, looking at the presence of the activated target in the tumor cell as a predictive factor. Maybe tools like that will be helpful for the future. Actually, the molecular heterogeneity of these tumors call for that. So beyond third-line treatment, we will need to look at that as well. And I think the different inhibitors that we have uh, actually occurring, uh, being studied, AKT, PI3K, mTOR inhibitors, which actually showed some interesting level of activity in phase two and phase one studies, need to be studied according to this, um, uh, to the, to this vision. Which are the molecular subsets of agents, uh, of uh, GIS, which are uh, accessible to these agents? Uh, the observation that some subsets, including the imatinib and sunitinib resistant subset, may be more sensitive, in particular with PDGF receptor alpha mutation, is something worth exploring further. The same is true for the HSP90 inhibitors, which are agents which have been considered to be active in, in, in the past, potentially because KIT and PDGF receptors are client proteins. Whether this is true has been studied in several clinical studies. Some of them failed. This one reported a proof of concept which is of interest, which may be something which is not fully re uh, related to the nature of the mutation. Time will tell whether this class of agent has some interest in, the, in all molecular subset of GIST and at which level should we investigate further. This is certainly uh, the future, and the summary of all HSP90 inhibitor trials which have been done so far should not discourage us from investigating this question f further. So to, to, to end up, I would like to call for clinical trials which are addressing specific molecular subset of GIST, and we probably have no more than 100 patients on this planet with the 842V mutant GIST to be included in such clinical trials as crinolinib, as our colleagues in the US are, are, are performing right now. This is certainly the way forward, as is a way forward to study some specific inhibitors on other pathways which are uh, activated in some of these uh, different tumor types. BRAF mutations are observed in about 10% of, um, of so-called wild-type GIST, and probably BRAF inhibitors deserve to be investigated further. I will call for uh, this final conclusion of this uh, presentation that probably we should not investigate exactly the same way that we did in the past the, 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 the new agents, comparing face-to-face -face a new agent versus a previous standard agent, but try to find some more innovative combinations such as rotation. And I know that John Z Zalgberg uh, is currently working on such a trial, and I think that is definitely the future of the treatment of this uh, pa patient. That's the challenge that we have for GIST, to understand the molecular biology tumor heterogeneity and resistance. There are new classes of agents. There are different diseases which should be treated differently. Thank you very much for your attention.